My name is David Campbell. I work for uh, the Institute for Systems Biology in the lab of Dr. Rob Moritz. Uh, we do a variety of proteomics techniques there. I work in the lab of Dr. Rob Moritz. Um, the lab does a number of proteomics te techniques. Um, I myself am a software engineer, and so I work on a number of projects such as Peptide Atlas and the TPP. I think there are several different uh, barriers that need to be overcome. Um, first of which, there are many different uh, file formats. All the different data types produce their own uh, distinct file types. They have different fields. Um, so even uh, within the proteomics field, there are many different data types for protein expression. And uh, therefore, merging those disparate data types can be difficult. You, you essentially need a translator between the different types. Other barriers are that um, the various instrumentation um, can be expensive. Um, the knowledge required to, to successfully analyze the data takes some time to, to obtain. And so it's difficult for any lab to have all the expertise and the instrumentation needed to, to do these types of analyses. So protein levels do fluctuate uh, with cell cycle and disease state and things like that. Um, the sort of more transient fluctuations, say with cell cycle, should be averaged out if you, if you sample, say, a population of cells or a whole tissue. Um, this may change in the future when we actually do proteomics on single cells. Um, but if you are interested in such uh, cycle-related transient differences, you can basically start with a synchronized cell population and uh, do a time course experiment, for instance, to see the, the rise and fall. Um, but basically, it's just good to keep in mind uh, that uh, these differences do occur and, and include this in your interpretation. I think this is very difficult to do um, because primary sequence uh, with a primary sequence, it's difficult to tell exactly how it will fold, and once folded, uh, what the characteristics of that particular charge shape, charge space is. Um, you can approximate this by looking for conserved regions and homology to existing uh, proteins or subsequences that have been solved. Um, so you can approximate it, but, but never really de novo. I guess ultimately I think that proteomics data can be thought of as gene-centric as well because every protein is the product of some gene um, and possibly some uh, post-translational modifications or uh, splicing. So yes, uh, proteins all come from genes and so therefore there is a one-to-one -one mapping. One difficulty is that uh, there are different accession spaces between genetics and proteomics. Um, and so, so coming up with a robust and reliable way to translate these back and forth is useful. So the main projects I've been involved with at ISB are the Peptide Atlas and the TPP, um, more so the Peptide Atlas. Uh, they are both uh, evolving uh, in response to user demand. Um, but I think that's something very important in general in, in uh, software development is that a lot of times software developers want to develop what they think will be a good solution without really contemplating, without really getting feedback all the time from the users. So I think that's the most important thing is to listen and, and get feedback and develop what is necessary, not what you think you want to develop. So the TPP is pretty, um, pretty mature in the context of data-dependent analysis, um, but we're expanding it in the realm of uh, DIA um, and other techniques. We're continuing educational outreach, having uh, TPP courses literally all over the world. Um, in the last two years, we've had courses in Brazil, in Ireland, in Taiwan, in India. Um, 
and other places, several in the United States. So uh, it, it really is an educational effort to, to basically help people understand what the tool is and how to use it. So one of the main challenges with Peptide Atlas is that it depends on public data sets. And so as soon as we make a build, uh, it's almost obsolete. It's time to go collect more data, reprocess it, and remake the Atlas. And we're talking about pretty vast amounts of data. There's a scientist at ISB named Z Sun um, that does most of this data wrangling. And she's very good at uh, basically processing large amounts of data in a consistent and efficient way. One interesting uh, technical issue from a programming standpoint is the protein supergroup issue. So basically, uh, one of the problems I meant to allude to earlier between proteomics um, and genomics is with proteomics, you typically get peptide sequence. And peptides can map to multiple proteins, so it's sometimes difficult to infer from just the peptide sequence exactly which proteins you have. Uh, so we, there's a program called Protein Profit, and there's other ones uh, that basically solve this protein inference, inference problem. You've identified these peptides, so what proteins, the minimal group that is explained by all your experimental data. Um, so it turns out uh, Protein Profit is good at doing this by applying Occam's razor, which is basically the simplest explanation is the correct one. In the peptide atlas, there are so many peptides that uh, we have, we've gotten what is called a supergroup. So basically, there's enough, there are peptides that map to multiple proteins, and once, and, and they sort of tie together these different groups. And so it's, it's a little bit hard to explain, but basically, because of the sequence homology, we end up, and, and the, the massive uh, coverage in the peptide atlas, we end up with this huge group of, of proteins, which we think we've seen, but uh, it's difficult for the existing tools to deconvolute and decide exactly what we have seen. I think the most important thing is to take the time to, to learn about the data technique and the tools available before jumping into your analysis. It's too easy to, to you know, be eager to push your project forward and, and uh, uh, basically you know, order some sequencing be done or, or what have you, and then start running tools without really understanding them. The other thing to do is to, to read the literature and, and see how other people that have, had this, have analyzed the same data um, are approaching this problem. And finally, one of the most powerful ways for doing any data analysis is from the command line. Um, it allows you to string together uh, pipelines of, of um, programs, as we heard discussed today. Um, it allows you to do your analyses on the cloud, um, which is very scalable. So, so learning to use uh, programs at sort of the expert level, and, and this is generally the command line, I think is very useful, especially for a graduate student. When you first started the question, I thought you were talking about commercial packages, which basically uh, purport, which, which claim that they can knit together these different data types. And I think often they can uh, for, for very specific data types. Um, I think in the open source community, which TPP is part of, um, um, and there's others, like there's genomics open, uh, open projects like SAM tools and, and others. Um, there, there are efforts to, to make a common data language. So if you, if you have a common data language, then pretty much any tool that you use can be, can be shared or can be extended to use other types of data. So I think in the, in the open source space, there is a desire and a recognition that interoperability is important. I think from a commercial company, they're more interested in having you buy their software, and so they're less interested in making everything interconvertible. 
Um, another scientist at ISB named Eric Deutsch does a lot of work on uh, various standards initiatives, uh, like the Proteome Standards Initiative. And uh, so basically they come up with, with defined file types uh, and, and uh, defined ontologies, uh, descriptive languages for communicating information. And, uh, and I think, yeah, that sort of coming up with common formats and language is the most important part of interoperability. My name is Luis Mendoza. I'm a software engineer um, at the Institute for Systems Biology in the Proteomics uh, lab of Dr. Robert Moritz. Um, I've been working there for the past almost 15 years. Uh, my main goal has been to um, develop uh, the software for the Transproteomic Pipeline, which um, is an open source free collection of uh, analysis tools, validation, quantification, um, and integration tools, a visualization that enable uh, the uh, advanced analysis of uh, high throughput proteomic data uh, from many kinds of instruments uh, under many conditions. Um, we've had great success. We have thousands of uh, people, over hundreds of uh, uh, labs around the world, uh, from small labs all the way to big pharmaceutical companies that to some extent use our software. And we keep, uh, and so that's what I've been doing there for the last 15 years. Well, there are many barriers as I see it. Um, one of them is, uh, part of the barriers are uh, just purely technical. Uh, obviously, there's all kinds of data being acquired in different omics um, uh, platforms. But bringing all this data together is still uh, kind of a challenge. Um, mostly because um, it starts with the researchers. Many researchers specialize in one area or another, and so uh, when they try to integrate their data, there's no uh, easy way uh, to do it. So it's up maybe to software to um, enable maybe doing this, uh, connecting genes to proteins to um, um, uh, transcriptome data and, 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 and many other data. So um, I think at the moment, just having a, being able to provide um, a good software platform or even uh, portals where one can integrate the data. And this has been, is already being done to some extent uh, but that's probably the biggest barrier. Um, also, uh, l learning about this different data and uh, how, how to interpret different data. Uh, a genomicist may not really be able to understand uh, proteomic data, for example, very well. So that's also uh, a, a common barrier. If you don't have a good um, collaboration with someone else, that may uh, make it a little bit more difficult. For TPP specifically for our software, um, uh, even though yes, uh, definitely a lot of uh, efforts have, are being done to move towards uh, proteomics, uh, there will still always be a need to some extent to do uh, the identification and validation of just pure peptides and proteins. So that, that part of it might not go away. With these new techniques over the years, uh, we have so far proven that TPP has been able to evolve um, to um, to accommodate different kinds of data sets, different kinds of um, techniques and analysis. Um, for, uh, we're doing RNA-seq already. We're doing other things. So uh, there is very much a possibility that if this is where the field is moving, that we will uh, expand our tool sets, expand, um, create new software. If this is what is um, yeah, required um, for the field, that we'll be able to uh, provide those. Or in some case, perhaps have third-party tools that we integrate, as we already do, to have a more complete solution and a single, um, perhaps, software platform that people can uh, rely on. This is always a, a tricky question, and we actually have um, many users who use TPP um, for organisms that have poorly characterized proteomes. Um, it is obviously, indeed, um, fairly uh, difficult to do. Um, TPP specifically does require some sort of uh, reference. Uh, this is the basis of uh, uh, just um, sequence database searching. But there are other tools out there um, that we don't specifically have within TPP uh, other than doing a simple gene translation to 
just to, to protein, um, that allow you to, um, to generate a customized database. For example, you can have, um, if you have um, RNA-seq data, uh, you can, um, from your organism that you're studying, you can generate uh, from that using a set of tools, uh, a pipeline that is not something we have developed, but that we are using at uh, ISB to then generate uh, a customized database that very much looks like a sequence database um, that you will use to then search against. So uh, at the moment, uh, and, and the reason we don't have this in TPP yet is for two reasons. One of them, uh, other groups have already written these tools, so why write the tool again? Uh, but the second most important one is because uh, uh, at the moment, uh, this data requires a very uh, large amount of processing power and, and memory and time. And most, uh, most normal computers are not able to even do this in several days' time. Uh, we have access to large computers, and even then it takes easily uh, one full 24-hour day to even analyze. So uh, we're trying to figure out ways that we can make this a little more efficient and faster, um, and we're still working on that. I think in general, in, in, in science, you, you want a combination of collaboration and competition. So um, there are other teams that develop certain software that in some ways, maybe the community or even we think is better than something we have or maybe something we don't have, and we're able to integrate it with ours to make the whole platform better. Um, obviously, other, there are other teams that make similar software to TPP that uh, allows us to have a little bit of competition or a lot of competition. Um, I think that keeps us all providing a better software product, or you know, even if it's free, to everyone. Um, and so I don't think it's necessarily one is better than the other. Um, a tool is as good as your, you know, your ability to use it. So you know, even a very fast car, if you don't know how to drive it, it's of no good to, to you. So um, I think for a large amount, all of the tools that are still um, out there that are popular all score perhaps uh, fairly evenly. Um, in the end, it's really up to the researchers to figure out in their hands if they can use it to get to their, to their answers and if it's easily available um, uh, on, you know, to, to, a large, uh, to a large audience. Um, obviously, we think our tools well, are worth uh, a look since we, they work very well for us and um, we often uh, compare them to, to the other ones and we think they, they are very competitive and in our hands, in our hands they uh, do perform the best, at least in the free software um, environment. So uh, TPP is, um, unlike some other software out there, it's great because it has been evolving over the last uh, more than 15 years. Uh, what started as a, just a, a simple program to perhaps validate uh, just peptide assignments has grown into a, um, uh, a, a number of software that can do end-to-end -end all, all kinds of analysis, uh, validation, quantification, different methods, um, visualization in different ways, alignment. And so it has been great to be able to provide the researchers, uh, mostly in our lab uh, initially, and then of course to the entire uh, or a large part of the community, worldwide community, uh, tools that will enable them to do great things. Um, I guess as a software developer, I feel like a very small part of someone else's success when they actually do something very interesting with our tools. Um, and that's where the true uh, value lies in the tools. It's not exactly you know something I do, but you know, that it enables uh, researchers to find uh, cures for disease or uh, new ways to, you know, maybe um, uh, eradicate some other, um, you know, organisms that, you know, that are uh, affecting, you know, some type of virus or something. So, um, in order to make it relevant, we, over the years, we've had to collaborate with um, our scientists and external scientists and being out here to be, uh, even when you, uh, for example, reach out and teach or present at conferences, we get a lot of feedback and that enables the tools to um, become more mature and perhaps more useful to everyone. Mm -hmm. 
some of the capabilities uh, students need to do this um, is definitely a um, familiarity which is with because we have now a high throughput very large data sets uh, you have to be able to have a, a, a basic understanding of just basic statistics in the experiment design but also you know um, basics of how to use uh, several computer software and be able to analyze their or evaluate the results to see which one works best for you um, at the most basic level most of the or many of the softwares out there will have a fairly easy to use interface however um, there can be many ways uh, many reasons why it can be a little bit difficult to use if they have different data formats so you have to familiarize yourself with those pipelines um, um, it's also very useful for students if they can learn even a little bit to just use things on the command line and other things like R, uh, the, the statistical language R, because then you can really unlock um, um, other features that may not be obvious just on a simple graphical user interface. Um, especially if you're doing high throughput studies with many, many, uh, many samples, uh, this makes your life far more efficient and easier. Uh, than doing this. So there are little things that you can do that perhaps wouldn't be too difficult to learn that will really give you a, a lot of um, a value for your time. Um, and other than that, obviously, uh, talk to other students, talk to your professors, talk to maybe uh, people that develop tools to help you uh, figure out how to best use them and how to get to the results that you're looking for um, so that you spend more time doing interesting research than just trying to run uh, some software. I mean, the challenges are still uh, around, so they're, they're, there's always a challenge, and uh, you know, like they say, you always consider that an opportunity. So, um, you know, there's always times when something doesn't work, uh, gives, or a new data set that gives you now a strange result that you weren't expecting because you didn't have that data set before. And so this always come up constantly, um, and that makes the tools uh, more robust. So we were able to solve that problem, then that means that after that, anyone with this type of data will hopefully have that problem solved for them with the tools. So, um, and, you know, so one of the challenges is just not having all the data around. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, but, that makes it fun for us to uh, try to solve the problem and, uh, and provide an answer.